Good morning. I'm thankful we can be together again as the body of Christ. God knows what each of us is going through during this difficult time. He makes no mistakes, and he is able to uh, carry us through uh, these uncertain times. I trust you are remaining encouraged in the Lord and orienting to him as he works faithfully in each of our lives, individually and personally. And I hope you're able to keep in touch with one another through uh, various means of technology that we have available. And I encourage you to share with one another during the week as you are encouraged in the Lord by something you read or um, something you've been meditating on and being lifted up by it, that you would send an email, give a call to someone and uh, share how you've been encouraged. And I just pray that all of you continue to be encouraged in the Lord and strengthened and not to uh, lose hope and not to be or feel lonely or discouraged uh, when those thoughts start to enter your mind, it's really time to quickly turn to the Lord once again. So be encouraged. Let's begin this morning with prayer. Now, Father, we bow our heads before you, acknowledging that you are the almighty God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. You are sovereign over all and supreme. And Father, Yet you are so great, uh, you have chosen to love us, uh, even to the degree that when we sinned against you and we had no way to reconcile ourselves back to you, you gave your only son. Thank you for uh, an unbelievable, immeasurable we can't understand how much you love us, Father, but I pray that each of us would remember you do love us. And your love is unconditional, Father, so I pray that we would be encouraged as we meditate on your goodness, your character. And Father, now as we open your holy word and again, once again meditate on the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray that it would really we would be impacted by the power of the Holy Spirit through the truth of your word, that we would further be strengthened and encouraged and moved in our hearts at the importance of the resurrection uh, to all the fundamentals of our faith, Father. It touches every one of them. So open our eyes, encourage us in the truth of your word this morning in that regard. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Well, last week, we began looking at the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the essential foundation for fundamentals of our faith. Our focus was on the resurrection as the foundation of our hope. That's what we looked at last week. Our hope both in life today and in life after death. And it was very significant that we have hope today and we have hope beyond the grave. Praise God. We looked at 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Peter 1 and noted uh, that our hope in life today rests in God's sure character and all of the grace blessings that we find in Jesus Christ. And this was all validated by the resurrection of Christ. And our hope in life after death is based upon Christ being the first fruits of those of the church, of those in Christ. He is the guarantee of our bodily resurrection after death. Our hope after death not only includes the fact that we will rise, but we saw our hope includes much more, such as the redemption and transformation of our bodies to be like him, appearing with him in glory, our adoption and inheritance, our life in his kingdom here on earth, and then our final eternal home, the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, being with Christ and all the saints together in perfect righteousness without end. This is the hope we have because Jesus Christ rose from the dead. This hope should pop your suspenders and fill your heart with great joy. We should feel like we are going to burst with excitement when we think of what is awaiting us because Jesus rose from the dead. Just as Aveline and Roman and Miles sang last week, it's not death to die. Amen. For us, it is life. And oh, what a life we have with Christ. Both today and yet in the future, it's even going to be greater and greater. Does Christ fill your heart? Does he fill your life? Is he your joy in life? Is he your hope? Are you excited about Jesus Christ? I trust you are. This morning, we will continue and we will conclude. This will be the final message uh, on the resurrection. Uh, we will be looking at the resurrection as the foundation for the biblical fundamentals and we will look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the foundation of our faith, our justification, our eternal security, and our future resurrection. And so now let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you would. 1 Corinthians 15, we will be looking at verses 12 through 18. This is the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the foundation of our faith. Paul well establishes in this passage that if Christ did not rise from the dead, our faith is worthless without effect. But before we read those verses, I just want to look at the first four verses. In the first four verses of chapter 15, Paul refers to the resurrection 
as part of the good news, the gospel. And we will find that the resurrection is an absolute essential part of the good news of Jesus Christ. Now let's read verses 1 through 4 in 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And of course, those scriptures are the Old Testament scriptures. And it may surprise you that, yes, the whole Old Testament scriptures taught that Christ died for our sins. They also taught that he was buried and that he rose again. What wonderful news even the Old Testament saints had. Now, verse 1, looking at verse 1, verse 1 addresses the inception of our salvation. They received the gospel and they stand in it. That idea, the standing in it is the idea that they are adhering to it or continuing in it. While verse 2 is talking about our life after salvation, which relies heavily on the resurrected Christ. Verse 2 requires an understanding of the contextual meaning of the word save, sozo in the Greek. And if we don't understand that, we, th we could think that this verse that Paul is teaching in this verse, he's saying that we must hold fast to the gospel to be saved. What would that be? Yes, that'd be a works gospel. And the Bible doesn't teach a works gospel. It's by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. But the specific nuance of a word is always defined by its context. And this word save, I'm going to give you three example, examples of three different nuances, but first I'll say that in Vine's dictionary, if you look up sozo, save, to save, you will see that Vines has nine different nuances of the word save. For instance, when Peter was walking on the Sea of Galilee toward Jesus, and he took his eyes off of Jesus, and he started to sink, and he said, Lord, save me. What did he mean? Lord, save me. Did he mean, Lord, save me from eternal condemnation? separated from you for all eternity. Is that what he meant? Second meaning that we will talk about, I'm only going to talk about three. What did Paul mean when he said to the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved? That's the number one a nuance that we always think of in the word sozo, to be saved from eternal condemnation. What about James? What did James mean when he wrote in James 1.21? That receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. What did he mean there? Well, James 1.21 is, James was writing to believers. And James is saying 
as believers, we have to receive the implanted word. And when we have God's word available and accessible in our minds, then when we are tempted or tried in some way to sin, we have access to the truth that we can apply. And that is what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 15 too. Let's look at that once again. Verse 2. He's talking about the gospel in verse 1, and he says, by which, the, the gospel, by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Paul is saying, you are saved or you are delivered if you apply the truth of the gospel that you received. You are saved or delivered from the power of and the bondage of sin if you apply the truths embedded in the gospel. So what are those truths? Well, there are uh, numerous truths there, but I boil them down to this very simply this. Christ died to sin. In his death, Christ died to sin and rose to life. And the life that Christ now lives, this is found in Romans 6, and the life that he now lives, he lives to God. So it follows that in Christ, we have been freed from sin and can live alive to God. If we hold fast if we believe and apply the truths of the gospel, we will be delivered. We will be saved, as it is in verse 2. We will be saved from the power and the bondage, the enslavement of sin. Now, the last phrase in verse 2, to believe in vain, is to believe to no effect, to believe and then not apply it in your life. This is why believers come back under the bondage of sin. They don't apply the truth that they believed when they were first saved. And so... Paul is saying, by which the gospel, the truths in the gospel, by which you will be delivered if you take those truths and apply them in your life, unless you believed in vain. What you believed is literally, it's vain, it's useless, it's empty. It has no effect in your life. And then, verses 3 and 4, the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is an absolute essential part of the gospel. Without the gospel, where would we be? Look at verse 17. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. If Christ is not risen, your faith is worthless. And you are still in your sins. You see, the resurrection is absolutely essential to the gospel. Now, in verses 12 through 19, 
Paul's train of thought follows that the concept of the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of man should not be separated. They are one and the same. I'll explain this a little further as we go on. Robert Gramacki says, and I quote, There was a false teaching in Corinth that Christ had been raised out of the sphere of the dead bodies, literally out of dead ones, and they equally testified that there would be no resurrection of the dead ones themselves. That is taken from uh, his uh, <clears throat> commentary on 1 Corinthians, called to be saints, Robert Gramacki, pages 185 and 186. And based upon the false teaching there in Corinth, they believed that Christ rose from the dead but they didn't believe that man was going to be raised, be resurrected. Paul was combating those people in these verses 12 through 19. Now let's read these verses. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. So in verses 12 through 19, Paul, as we just read, is putting forward three arguments to demonstrate what a denial of a future resurrection would lead to. Argument number one, the denial of the resurrection means that Christ is still dead. Verse, verses 12 and 13. Christ took on flesh, he became a man, he was fully man just like every man, he died physically like men die, and he rose like men will rise. We cannot separate Christ out from what man, humankind, experience in death. His death and resurrection is what man will experience, those in Christ. So that's fairly significant uh, if we deny the resurrection that uh, Christ is uh, still uh, dead. The second argument, the denial of the resurrection means that Paul's message was wrong, verses 14 through 16. It goes on that Paul's message was therefore empty of content. It was void of truth. And their faith was empty. Their faith was out effect, without effect, no power, fruitless. Paul was therefore also a false witness of God. Further, Paul incriminates God if the dead do not rise because they are speaking on behalf of God. And if the dead do not rise, 
Paul repeats again, he says, Christ is not risen. Christ is still dead. The third argument, the denial of the resurrection means that people are still in their sins. Verses 17 through 19. He begins by saying once again, repeating again, your faith is futile, worthless, without purpose. If our faith is in, if our faith is in one who is dead, isn't that a problem? And in verse 17, and therefore we are still in our sins. That phraseology Christ himself used in John chapter 8, verses 21 and verse 24, Jesus said, If you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And Paul is saying, If Christ did not rise, then we are still in our sins. What a horrible place to be. And then in verse 18, and those who have died have perished. That word perish uh, indicates destruction. It means they've gone to destruction. And if Christ is not risen, we of all men, verse 19, are the most pitiable because because what? We've believed a lie. We've given up our lives to live for Jesus, and then we die and then perish. Yes, we would be the most pitiable if that were true. Paul has stressed here the resurrection of Christ as paramount and the foundation of our faith. If Christ did not rise, Paul says, he, number one, he is still dead. Number two, our gospel message is not true. Number three, our faith is without effect, without power. Number four, we are still in our sins and we will perish. But let's turn the tables. Christ did rise, therefore, Our gospel message is true and in harmony with the true God. Our faith is powerful and greatly effective. Our Savior is alive. Our sins are forgiven. We are not pitiable at all. We have eternal life and a living hope. Praise God. Now, one more passage I want to look at displaying the resurrection as the foundation of our faith. Turn with me uh, to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. I I love this, and the more I looked at it and meditated on it, uh, I I just got excited. Uh, The the verses we're actually going to be looking at are verses 32 through 35. And in in this passage, uh, Acts, in this entire passage, Acts 4, especially the first four verses, it, it reveals something. The enemies of Christ reveal how important the resurrection is. I love that. They inadvertently, by their hype about the resurrection, if you look closely and you think about it, they are, his enemies are revealing how significant the resurrection of Christ was. Uh, Lending context to the verses we will be looking at, notice in chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, one main issue that greatly disturbed the religious leaders was, what, was that the apostles were preaching that Jesus rose from the dead. They were infuriated that they were preaching that. 
Why? Because all of the religious leaders knew that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And they knew the powerful implications of his resurrection. So this preaching by the apostles, this had to stop. Now let's read verses 1 through 4. Now as they spoke to the people... And this, <clears throat> this is the, uh, Peter and John speaking to the, the crowd. As they spoke to the people, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Imagine. We're just days after the day of Pentecost, and 5,000 have already been saved and the main message is Jesus rose from the dead. He died for your sins, but he rose again. How exciting. This was actually the beginning of the persecution of believers after the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. All to stop the message of Christ resurrected. Let's see what they are doing here. Let's turn now to uh, verses 32 through 35 and read. Now the multitude, we're talking about the multitude, maybe some of the 5,000, I don't know how many. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. We'll stop our reading there. I ask you a question. What accounts for this radical change of people being willing to sell their lands, sell their houses, and give all of the proceeds, all of the proceeds to the apostles so that they could distribute them to the poor. Needless to say, these were extraordinary times. It was the powerful witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that caused this phenomena to happen. And if you take verse 33 out of the paragraph, what they were doing wouldn't be easily understood. Verse 33, and with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. You take that verse out and you would say, why would so many people sell their homes, sell their lands, and give it all to the poor? And likewise, note the boldness of Peter and John before the religious leaders in verse 19 and 20, verses 19 and 20. But Peter and John answered and said to them, the religious leaders, the priests, 
Sadducees and the temple captain, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Wow. And why would almost all of the apostles become martyrs? For the sake of preaching and defending the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Would they have given their lives to uphold a lie like was said by the religious leaders that they were doing? I don't think so. Their faith was greatly strengthened because of the resurrection. And I challenge myself that my faith will be greater will be more greatly strengthened by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's more powerful than we can imagine. I encourage you to think greatly upon this. Now, we turn to our next uh, point. The resurrection of Jesus Christ as the foundation of our justification. Turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And let's read, beginning in verse 20, Romans 4, verse 20. It says, he, Abraham, it doesn't say Abraham, but that's who it's referring to, did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully convinced that what he had promised He was also able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Because we were justified on the basis of Christ's redemptive work on Calvary's cross, the Father raised his Son from the dead to validate his work as efficacious, as effective in paying the full price of our sin debt. The validation is of utmost importance because God who claims to be righteous and just is declaring sinners to be righteous. How can this be? How can a sinner be righteous? Well, because God laid on his own son the sin of the entire world. For those who believe in his son, God is just in forgiving and declaring him to be righteous. Another angle to this point that he was raised because of our justification at the end of verse 25. Another angle to this point is, I say, because Christ died, he had to be raised because of our justification. God could not declare us righteous if Jesus didn't rise From the dead. If he did not rise, we would still be in our sins, and surely, therefore, 
We could not be declared righteous. We could not be declared justified by God, by a God who is just. How could God say, I have declared you righteous if he did not rise and we were still in our sins. Could he declare us righteous? Absolutely not. So Christ was raised because of our justification. The next foundation stone or important fundamental, the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the foundation of our eternal security. Turn with me to, well, we're, we're there, uh, Romans uh, 5, 10. Let's read verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The argument in this verse is from greater to lesser. It goes like this. If the greater statement is true, it is far more certain that the lesser statement is true. If, and it is true, we were reconciled to God while we were his enemy, how much more as God's children will we be saved by his life? I believe this phrase, saved by his life, is true in two ways. And Ron Merriman sums it up as he comments on Hebrews 7.25, which says, Therefore he, Christ, is also able to save to the utmost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. A quote from Ron, he is able to, one, save us to the utmost, that means completely or forever, Number one, he is able to save us to the utmost in regard to time. That is, forever. And number two, he is able to save to the utmost degree, that is, to save and deliver entirely from sin and its effects, regardless of the depths of of one's depravity, end of quote. How much more will we be eternally secure and in our life be delivered from the power of sin and its effects all because Jesus rose from the dead and always lives to make intercession for us? Praise God. Here is the power of Christ's resurrection at work in our lives today. Romans 6, 10 through 12. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust. You see, we've been freed. We do not have to allow sin to reign in our mortal bodies, all because Jesus died in our place and rose again. The next foundation 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the foundation of our resurrection. Turn back with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Last week, we, we did read this, and we were looking, the emphasis last week was basically in verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. And so uh, this week I want to focus on verses 22 through 23 and realize that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is our hope. It is our guarantee that we will bodily be resurrected like Christ was. Now let's read, starting in verse 20. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. So in verse 20, when Christ rose from the dead, it says he became our first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, of those who have died. And he's referring to the church, those who have died in Christ. Now, the law of Moses, Exodus 23, 16, provided for an offering of the first fruits of the crops to God. The first fruits were the guarantee of the full harvest that was yet to come. The New Testament sees the resurrection of Jesus Christ as the first fruits of the full ingathering of all God's people when Christ comes again, end of quote. And that quote was taken from the dictionary of Bible themes. Now in verses 21 and 22, death came by man. It says in verse 22, in Adam, we all died. But it says, by man, the man Jesus Christ, the God-man, came the resurrection of the dead. Those in Christ will be made alive. And then in verse 23, Christ's resurrection is the guarantee of our resurrection at his coming. And let's look at that resurrection. Look at verse 50 in the same chapter. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this incorruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? In Christ's resurrection, 
you and I are guaranteed to have eternal victory over death. We will end now this morning with these encouraging verses which speak of our resurrection because he rose. In John 11:25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? John 14, verses 19 and 20. This was the night just before Jesus was crucified. And Jesus said, A little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. In Romans 8, verse 11, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And finally, Job 19, verses 25 through 27. These verses, every time I read them, they thrill my soul. For I know, Job says, for I know that my Redeemer lives. And he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see my God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Oh, how my heart yearns within me. I pray for our church family that our hearts yearn within us for the day of our resurrection. When we know we will see our Savior, we will be like him. We know in our flesh, though we were dead, we are now in our resurrected flesh. We We'll see our Savior. We will be like him in resurrected bodily form. That day will be the beginning of our eternal journey with our Lord and Savior. I pray you allow the truths of the resurrection to change your life and bring great joy to your heart as you spend time meditating on the all-powerful truth, our Savior lives. Let's bow in prayer. Father, it is with great joy that we have had time to spend on the resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ and how it is the fundamental stone on which we stand, on which we have strength, hope, encouragement. And Father, I pray in the days to come that we will continue to meditate on the resurrection of our Savior and the truth of it. And like the apostles' lives were set on fire, even willing to die, because they saw the resurrected Christ. And Father, we see from your word the resurrected Christ. We know and we understand, 
Father, may our may a fire be sparked in our lives to want to live for you as the apostles lived for you. Father, I pray that you would strengthen, encourage us as the days go by, as we face this situation we're in. Uh, may we reach out to one another, may we encourage one another, and may Equally as we do so, our hearts will be lifted up as well. We thank you, Father, that you are ever present with us. You will never leave us nor forsake us, Father. We take great hope in the future and are excited about our life with you to come. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. This Wednesday evening, we will gather for prayer. At 7 p.m., we will send out information to uh, connect up for that prayer time. Stay occupied and encouraged in the Lord. We'll see you Wednesday.